Good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight for a very special Q&A with SCA alumnus Eduardo Ponti, the director of the new Netflix original film, The Life Ahead, which just premiered globally and is now playing on Netflix. Um, I just wanted to briefly mention that Eduardo is a graduate of USC. Uh, he began working as an assistant to filmmakers such as Michelangelo Antonioni and Robert Altman. Uh, in 2002, Ponti made his directorial debut with Between, uh, Between Strangers, directing his mother, Sophia Loren. In 2011, he wrote and directed the critically acclaimed irreverent uh, romantic comedy, Coming and Going. And in uh, 2012, his short film, The Night Shift Belongs to the Stars, won Best Live Action Short at the Tribeca Film Festival. In 2014, Ponti took his short film, Human Voice, based on a theatrical piece by Jean Cocteau, to Cannes. The film starred uh, Sophia Loren, who, would, uh, who went on to win the David of Donatello Award for her performance. The Life of Head reunite, reunites uh, Ponti with his mother and marks his third directorial feature. So let's please welcome Eduardo Ponti. Thank you so much for joining us. So happy to be here, really. Thank you, Alex. So happy. And lest anyone be fooled, you're, you're, you're calling in from Santa Monica and not from Rome. I am calling from Santa Monica. I could fool you and say that I'm coming from Rome, but I'm calling from Santa Monica, yes. Um, so thank you so much for making such a beautiful film. I, uh, thank you. You know, it's, it's rare to see something uh, that is this full of emotion and is such a cinematic film, but is coming to us on our television sets, uh, you know, in our computers globally, um, though it would have been wonderful to screen it in Norris, and I hope that we'll get that chance at some point. Um, but it seems like this film was absolutely tailor-made for um, a, a, a tremendous performance by your mother. Can you talk a little bit about deciding uh, to, to, to adapt this novel and that it was going to be something that would really yeah. highlight um, your mother's work? You know, this book, uh, La Vie de Bonsoir by Romain Gary, was a, was a book that was on my proverbial nightstand for years, something that uh, had accompanied me for many, many years. I was, I was very, very drawn and inspired by not only the um, story of love and friendship between two people, Madame Rose and Momo, that everything separates, you know, race, religion, culture, generation, but at the end, they're just opposite sides of the same coin. You know, they're both raised in the streets without families and they've and they're survivors defined by by uh, by pain by suffering but also hope and resilience so that was the first thing that to me really spoke uh, and the second thing was how Romain Gary told the story through the point of view of this 12 year old uh, immigrant child and I found that very very powerful to be able to look at life look at the world look at look at days through the point of view of this, this, this child. And in a world that is so polarized, um, you know, being able to look at life through the eyes of others is the beginning of connection and the beginning of empathy. And these two things meant a great deal to me. So when it came to starting to think of how to make the movie, this also happens to be a book and a character in, in Madame Rosa that my mother always loved. So, you know, she had been waiting for 10 years, 11 years to do something that really meant a lot to her, something that moved her, something that inspired her, but also especially something that challenged her. And we worked so well together. You know, our rapport uh, as, as creative partners is so strong. We have the same objectives. And so we just jumped at the opportunity of doing this together. Well, the, the novel isn't obviously a contemporary novel. So can you talk a little bit about the adaptation process and sort of bringing it to the, you know, yeah. to, to a different era? Well, you know, the, the, the fortunate and unfortunate thing is that the themes that the uh, novel uh, uh, deals with uh, of, of tolerance, of immigration, of inclusion, of a prejudice, unfortunately, are still extremely current today. So really, thematically, nothing has changed from 1970, Belleville, France, to you know, 2020, Bari, Italy. It's, uh, the world is, uh, you know, hasn't really evolved so much. So the themes were extremely topical, extremely current. Um, 
And it was really a matter of finding what is timeless of the novel, i.e. those themes, but more importantly, that relationship, the relationship between Madame Rosa and Momo. So for us, for Ugo Kitti, who's a wonderful writer of uh, Gomorrah and Dogman, he was uh, my, uh, my writing collaborator, we really focused, we, we really made that relationship the heart and the spine of the film. So when one does that, when one chooses a very specific route, then you, you, you make choices that are all aligned to that. Um, and that's what we did. I also happen to have a great appreciation for a very thick uh, dialect, and it seems like your mother had uh, some of the <laughs> some of the thickest dialects in, in 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 a long time. Can you talk a little bit about uh, creating um, this in a language that's not exactly uh, what we we would consider the Italian of Dante, but you know? Yeah, you, you know, when I work with my mother, I want to give her the ability to be completely herself. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested so much in the Sofia written with a ph i'm interested in the sophia written with an f and uh, this is a performance by sophia loren written with an f not with a ph <laughs> these are these are truly her roots because when my mother speaks her native neapolitan language a lot of things happen first of all the most authentic uh, uh, part of her comes out but also what is very important is that neapolitan is a dialect not born in the throat but born in the belly and so the whole, her whole voice drops an octave and it, she naturally becomes grittier. She naturally becomes more street. She naturally became more the character just by the switch of the language, by, just by the switch of the cadence, the intonation and the dialect. And that was very important for the building of her character. So, and I'm, and I'm really happy that you noticed that because that was one of the very first choices. You know, how do you allow how do you let an actor into the character? How do you allow them to claim it? With my mother, it really starts with the language, you know, with, with the dialect. That's really how it starts because then it opens up a whole possibility of body language and expression and silences and looks that she would only really do only if she were to speak Neapolitan because she becomes her most, as we said, her most authentic self. It's just, I mean, aesthetically wonderful. To, to hear it, and then there's also expressions that are just priceless. So, um, uh, well, give us a sense of the casting because uh, I can't imagine it was, you know, easy to uh, to find the person to play opposite your mother. Um, how how did you go about it? Uh, I almost didn't think it was possible until it happened, and in the end, it wasn't the hardest role to cast. But, 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 but Ibrahim uh, Gueye, who plays Momo, uh, you know, is, is in every scene of the movie. And uh, this is a boy who had never acted uh, before. Mm -hmm. I had seen around 350 children, and he was one of the first I saw. And what really surprised me about him was just the way that he walked into the audition room. The, the audition scene was uh, an improv scene where he was supposed to sell me of improvised selling me the candlesticks that he had stolen. And as he was about to walk into the room, the door of the audition room got stuck. And instead of stopping and resetting, he used that into the scene. And I thought, you know what? It's so funny. He thinks like an actor. He's never acted. This is his first audition, but he thinks like an actor. And then after seeing 300, 350 children, I picked four of them. And I put them all in an actor's workshop, boot camp, really, for actors for a month. And I saw how they all kind of evolved. And it was very clear that he was, not only did he have the, uh, the passion for acting, but he really had the heart and the soul of Momo, especially for the second half of the movie. What was hard for him was to be the rude a-hole for the first third of the movie. Mm -hmm. And there it showed that he had amazing instincts because one day when we were rehearsing those first scenes where he had to be very tough with my mother and, and we weren't really getting to that intensity, he suddenly stopped and walked up to my mother at the end of the rehearsal and said, Sophia, can I tell you something? Every time that I have to be rude to you, I 
when I get, go home, it really hurts me because I don't want to say all these bad things to you. So can you just give me permission to do it? And my mother was like, absolutely. Of course I can give you permission. It's, it's, I'll never be offended. And this is just acting. And from that day on, he was so rude to my mother in the scenes and I could not have been happier. Wow. Wow. That's and that was his instinct. That was his instinct. Yeah. You would I mean, think amazing. that that was the part that, that a, a child actor would, would relish doing. No, it was hard. I mean, because, you know, for, for the role of Momo, you know, you have to, you cast for the heart, knowing that you can create the rest. You can't create heart if you, if you start with somebody who's very tough, right? It's very hard to create heart out of whole cloth. You ha it's very difficult. So that was really the thing that for him was the hardest to do. But he found a way of doing it that, of course, you know, uh, with our with our help and with our guidance and and with the tools we gave him with the acting techniques and with the skills really all I wanted you know was to give him enough tools for him to be himself mm. you know and uh, and I and 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 that's what happened you know he was very diligent you know the thing he told me when I gave him the role he looked at me straight in the eyes and he said I'm gonna commit to this a hundred percent and I believe them. I believe them, and he's he did. He was he was in every scene of the movie, and he committed a hundred percent. And as far as getting to the more emotional scenes, uh, you actually found that easier for him. For both, you know, for my mother and him, you know, uh, my mother, I'll do fifteen takes just for the silliest thing, and when it comes to emotional takes, no more than three. Wow. Uh, and with him, it was the same. They, they were very similar, you know, even though my mother, this is her 98th movie and this was his first, their, their fabric, their creative fabric, their, their, their sense of um, duty and responsibility and preparedness and learning the lines and being hitting the mark, they're both very, very similar. That's why they hit it off. And the other thing I did to really create the bond, because the other problem was, you know, we're making this movie in Italy. God knows what people told Ibra about my mother. You're so lucky. You don't realize what she's done. Oh my God. So I needed to demystify that. Sure. And I needed to be able to have him see my mother the way that I see her. So what we did during the whole shoot, we all lived together. So, oh. so my mother, so Ibra would see my mother in, in the morning without makeup, uh, watching TV. I would find them sometimes just sitting on, on a bench in, in our backyard, just doing nothing, just staring and just, just being together. So they really created that bomb that was so important to create so that on set, they could truly have that connection. That connection was not fabricated, it was real. Mm -hmm. So did he have the, uh, the instinct to, to run out and grab a, uh, well, I guess I would say grab a DVD of two women, but obviously uh, these days nobody's watching DVDs. No, he saw on YouTube. He saw things on YouTube and, and people told them. And, you know, but it was best for him not to see anything. You know, it was best for him not to see anything because it doesn't, you know, the less you see of the legacy, the more open you are to create something of your own. So, so I didn't encourage anything. I didn't tell him not to, but I didn't encourage anything. So dare I ask what scene did require 15 takes? Silly things. Uh, you know, uh, uh, like for example, the whole beginning in the kitchen, you know, when she's putting all the, you know, when she's ranting against them, you know, thing, things like that, you know, that are, that are more kinetic, that, that require a certain kind of, you know, it was, it was, you know, we needed to get the rhythm right. It was the first time that, that the character was truly showcased and it needed to have the right intensity the right rhythm and with all of the business of the dishes that did that, that it's just one shot no cuts it needed to have the right rhythm and the right intensity and the right kind of uh, choreography mm. and so and so that took uh, that took a while it's funny that you, you say that scene because it's that's exactly where I, I sort of snapped into my like early 50s or late 40s Italian cinema with you know the sort of the just vibrating authenticity you know, the, the language, the movement, the business in the kitchen and all of that. Um, so it, it was all working. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you mentioned that, that Momo wasn't the hardest role to cast. Which, which one was? Lola. Hmm. 
Oh, Lola. sure. Yeah, please talk about that. Yeah, Lola was, Lola, I really wanted to find somebody that was so, so, so authentic and such a breath of fresh air, you know, like, like, like a ray of sunlight and to find the right energy. You know, I, I, I auditioned many wonderful actresses in, uh, in Italy, but I couldn't find the right tone. It was a matter of a tone, finding the person that was able to, to have a comedic slant, but at the same time be authentically dramatic when she needed to be, feel mm. like a big sister, you know, to, to, be, to be very, very, and, uh, and in the end, I got lucky to find a, a Brill in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Spain. Mm -hmm. So we, we flew her to uh, Rome and we worked uh, together and it was, uh, it was great. It was great. And, 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 and my mother, when they did the dancing scene together, she just fell in love with the Brill. I mean, she just, she just loved it. They're, they're friends. I mean, they're, they're friends now because they hit it off so well during the shoot. Uh, tell us a little bit about what it's like to direct your mother. Uh, do you have a secret language, um, you know, that sort of comes from having worked together, but also from just, you know, having spent however many uh, years in, in film? Um, is there anything unique there about directing that maybe doesn't apply to the rest of the cast? I'm much harder on her. <laughs> much, much harder on her. I'm much, much harder on her because I know her so well. So I know, you know, uh, I know when she gives me 50%, I know when she gives me 100%, and I will not settle for any less than 100. Because if we do a movie together, it has to be unique, it has to be special, and, and we want to show the world the best of uh, Sophia. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so, but the good thing about our work together is that we have the same objectives. You know, creatively, we're both at the service of one thing, which is the story and the characters. And that helps because there is no other agenda. You know, when I, you know, when I told my mother very early on, you know, halfway through the movie, you're going to start having less and less makeup. And she was, you know, by the end of the scene, the final scene in the movie, when she's with uh, Momo in the, in the refuge, in the basement, she has no makeup. Zero. Zero. There is zero. But not zero, but there's really something. No, no, no. Zero. She has no eyelashes no makeup and so it's 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 a, anybody else it would have been difficult to convince them but there is so much trust there's so much love mutual love mutual trust that 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 and we have as i said the same objective that these things are possible together and it's absolutely beautiful it's absolutely beautiful was uh, was ibrahim uh, the only non actor that you cast no, there was Ibra, there was uh, uh, the, the, the Diego who plays Yosef, and of course the three-year-old Babu, Simone, is also, uh, all, the, all the kids were not actors, all the kids, it was their first movies. Yeah. The, um, the, one of the most famous stories of working with kids uh, in the history of cinema is Vittorio De Sica and the Bicycle Thief, telling the, the child that he had stolen something to get him to cry. Um, do you find that with actors that young, you have to kind of bl blur the lines a little bit, or are they are they pretty good at, at taking direction? No, I don't. I don't like fooling anybody. I I don't like fooling people because already what we do is a big is is one big illusion. So we might as well get to that illusion by being as honest as possible. Mm -hmm. So I I don't you know so 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 for me it was really about giving these kids the technical tools to be themselves, the mm. technical tools, and then to explain to them, like you would explain to any actor, what I was expecting. And you know what the good news is? We're experts of one thing. We're all experts of life. You mm. know, Ibra has been in life for 13 years. He's an expert at life. You've been doing this for 13 years. I've been doing it for 45 years. We're experts. So when in doubt, when you have a creative impasse, when you make a movie, always go back to the only question was what would really happen in life and we know the answers because mm -hmm. we've been living life for so long so it was the same thing here you know never expect a tear or laughter never expect a result but just share what would happen and create that context of of, of authenticity 
and then see what happens. You can guide them gently here and there because, and guiding really means the movie has to have a specific tone and everybody needs to be in the same movie. So that's really what a director does, right? He's a conductor making sure that we're all playing the same music. Not a person is not playing jazz and another person is playing hip hop. It's to be the same music, but the rhythms can be different. The colors should all be different. Some people are up, other people are down. That's, 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 that's the symphony of, of different actors coming together. But we all need to be playing the same type of music. And that's where directing is. And that's how you kind of frame people. For example, with Diego, the actor who plays Yosef, what I did to, to make sure that he felt comfortable is that the room that he, that he stays in is almost a replica of his actual room at home. Oh, wow. So that you create these environments where they feel comfortable. They don't feel judged. They feel helped. And, and also they have to feel like you are... As a director, you have to be very emotionally receptive to what they're doing. You have to show them that what they're doing is affecting you. Mm -hmm. Because film is all about a reaction. So if a director is sitting behind the monitor pretending not to react, or there's no a true connection between the actor and the director because the director is hidden behind the monitor, you're not gonna create that bond that you need to create. Because in the end, the actor will act for one person, it's the director. And that person is always in the forefront of their mind as they're acting. So that person needs to be a fan of their work. Mm. Well, you, you, you mentioned that uh, Ibra had some, obviously had to get Sophia's permission to, to be rude, but he also has some very powerful moments with Diego. Yeah. Um, and, you know, some, some very cutting remarks there too. Um, and I'm curious to know, the process of creating that trust between two kids who, you know, uh, don't have decades of experience in mm -hmm. film could, you know, potentially um, have some hurt feelings. I don't know. What, what was, was that easier or harder for, for Ibra to, to get to that place? You know, what was important about these children was A, these children did not have to create these characters. They are these people. You know, Ibra came to Italy five years ago. He knows what it means to be an immigrant. He knows what it means. He knows what the streets are. He's, he's Muslim. It was very important for me to, to cast a Muslim child so that he understood what it meant to have that faith. Diego is, is, uh, is, uh, is, you know, comes from a line of, uh, of, of, of Rome. So he also understands what the street is. So what, what was important is they have that authenticity, that reality baked in baked into their DNA, baked into their life experience. So that's not something that I had to create. And what you do to create a bond in between them is what happened is this Diego, I cast Diego because he was one of the four that I was auditioning for Momo. And then he was one of, and then I saw as they were going through this boot camp, I saw them really have a very strong relationship. And they were very, they had different energies. It was clear that Momo was more of an alpha male, was more dominant in the relationship because he was even older. And so Diego kind of looked up to him. And I realized that the relationship that they had was very similar to the relationship that Momo and Yosef had. So it was rather easy to create, for them to create that relationship because it was in a way the relationship that they had already in life. Um. I'm curious if, if there were any major significant departures from the novel. I, I haven't read it, but... Yeah. Uh, the, the, the major one to create that arc of the character, the relationship, was when Momo appeared in, uh, in Madame Rosa's life. In the book, they, he had appeared when he was a baby. And so, and so by the time that he was 12, 13, they had already a well-established relationship. Um, and that gave the book a certain, uh, a certain episodic rhythm that, 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 that we wanted to find a way to streamline. So really the big change is that Momo in our film arrives in, the, in, the, in, in Madame Rosa's house uh, when he's already 12. And the relationship really takes the course of maybe a year in these people's lives, let's say maybe nine months in these people's lives. Whereas in the book, it's a relationship that spans uh, many more years. Hmm. Um, 
I want to start taking audience questions, but I, I did want to just um, briefly touch on what you were saying uh, before we started the, the broadcast about being launched in 190 countries simultaneously. Mm. You know, that, that's obviously very unusual, whether or not it's streaming. I mean, certainly not something you would see if you were rolling the film out theatrically. Tell us what that experience was like. I mean, this is the, it just came out, so I'm, I'm curious yeah. how. Yeah, it, it came out uh, midnight on Friday, and the response really has been, I mean, overwhelming, you know, and what's really wonderful is how there are some truths, there are some emotions, there are some relationships that are universal. You know, empathy is universal. Uh, love is universal. Friendship is universal. Uh, the way that people look at each other. Uh, tenderness is universal. And it's beautiful to see how people react universally to these values and these themes that bind us all together. And it's also wonderful to see how people react completely differently to other things, to what they find funny, to mm. what they cry at. And, and, and it's amazing how in this day and age with social media, how they, people are so willing to share these things and to see and to feel uh, how people react differently and similarly to parts of the movie is just beautiful. You know, I mean, we're getting, you know, uh, you know, reaction. I mean, 190 countries, so you can imagine, from Israel, from France, from Germany, from America, from Italy. It's just absolutely beautiful and overwhelming. And what's also very special is that when you're on Netflix, you're, you know, people are welcoming you in their home. So it's also a different connection that you have, that people have with the movie. They're watching it with family members in a very specific time, which is a pandemic. And so where people are hungry for connection, where people are hungry for, for emotional uh, resonance. And so the response has been amazing. Amazing. Has there been, has there been anything in particular that, that just sort of surprised you? There's every, everybody keeps on repeating online over and over again a line that my mother says when Yosef leaves and uh, Momo is upset because of course his mother has passed away and Yosef's mother has come back to retreat of him. And she says in Italian, e quando non ci credi più che succedono le cose belle. It's basically, it's when you, when you give up hope that good things start to happen. And people keep on repeating that line over and over again. Why? Because many of us have given up hope with the pandemic. And this movie basically, you know, gives you a ray of hope that when you give up hope, when you stop believing, good things can still happen. Mm. And it's, and it's, and it's, and it's, and it's amazing. It's amazing. Um, I'm starting to see some questions coming in. So, uh, oh, so just for anyone who doesn't, who hasn't seen the film, if there, if there are people out there who haven't, um, the movie is playing on Netflix now so so uh as fear when can we see it the answer is immediately uh, now now and please and, and 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 please watch it in italian subtitled and the way you do that because many americans don't know how to do this we europeans know how to change languages on netflix and many americans don't let me tell you you swipe down you go on audio you click on audio you go on italian and then you click on subtitles and you go to english so you can watch the movie the way that it was intended. I mean, the idea that anyone would rob themselves of the experience of, of, of Sophia's incredible dialect in this film. I, I mean, know. Just, I, I don't understand it. Uh, no, but people, you know what, you know, you know, what's really fascinating is that many people that I know have seen it also in English and they've had an overwhelming, amazing response. But, but, you know, if, if you want to see it the way that it was intended, then do, do those few things that, that I told you. Um, okay, so I'm going to invite people over one by one individually as panelists so that you can turn on your video. Um, and if you're camera ready, you don't have to, but uh, we'll start with uh, Brando Benetton, who is one of our recent alumni. And uh, Brando, I'm going to move you over. Here we go. Hopefully you can hear me. Yeah, I can. Um, 
Edoardo, complimenti, se si potesse faremmo, visto che Alex parla italiano, avremmo fatto tutto in italiano, però non si può. Però non si può, per, per, però non si può, la prossima volta. <ride> um, I'd love to ask you, I mean, I don't want to throw too many questions, I would love to hear about your time at USC, specifically, I'm from Verona, I, I, I just think it would be interesting to, to compare uh, your experience as an Italian at USC, but as far as this movie is concerned, I'd love to know, you know, about your experience shooting in Bari with the Film Commission. You guys are there during the summer and you can, you know, anyone can imagine that Italy is always crowded with tourists and a movie like this, I'm sure people were talking and I don't know if that was of help or an obstruction in any way. And at the same time, I was wondering in regard to how a movie like this evolves from the way you thought you're going to direct it to the way you actually end up directing it. What about test screenings, you know, uh, friends and family? Were there suggestions that you saw that kept coming back to you that allowed you to further improve on the movie even more than you had envisioned it? Mm. Well, you always, you know, you, you have to surround yourself with the people that, uh, that you trust, who don't bullshit you, who will tell you the truth. And, uh, and, uh, and you have to be open to these uh, suggestions. So absolutely, you know, there were screenings Uh, I had a great team of producers and uh, I trusted their taste and, uh, and it was really a matter of seeing how the, the movie spoke to them and, uh, and to really try to understand what was the best tone for this kind of movie and for this kind of story. So the feedback is, is really, 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 really essential and one shouldn't be scared of it. You know, uh, uh, very often though in Italy, uh, producers are nervous to share their feedback with directors because directors in Europe are really uh, a, a very important figure, much more than in America where the producer and the star is really the driving force behind a movie. Also directors, of course, but less. In, in Europe, the power, the power is in the hands of the director. So sometimes the producers are nervous to share their thoughts because, you know, it's not really done. And I a thousand percent encouraged my team all the time. Tell me, tell me, tell me. And so they got used to that because in the beginning it wasn't so easy. And then they really, really very much got into this thing. And it was very important for me. And they had amazing ideas, amazing thoughts. So that was really wonderful. And when it comes to shooting in Bari, you know, the film commission there is wonderful because not only are they obviously very, very film friendly and they want to attract as much business as possible, but they have a very deep bench of filmmakers there, of, uh, of crew members. So we really got wonderful people working in secondary positions, not heads of departments, but wonderful positions like uh, the assistant art director or uh, the assistant costume uh, designer. All of them were actually from Bari. And they, were, they have a great deep bench of talent there. And, you know, shooting with my mother in Italy, you know, you would think is absolute, you know, it's, it's especially exterior scenes, absolute chaos. But the truth is, there is such a solemn response when people watch See My Mother that they're just speechless. And they have such respect and admiration. And that respect and admiration is translated in silence. So, you know, behind the camera, sometimes we had a thousand people. And when I called action, it was like we were in a church. And when I called cut, everybody would applaud. It was amazing. It was amazing. There was such respect and admiration and pride and, and tact and elegance when Italians just, just are, 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 are around my mother. That is just beautiful to behold. That's wonderful. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Grazie, grazie a te. Thanks, Brenda. Moving you back over and welcoming up Steve Buss. Are you with us, Steve? There, can you hear me? Okay, uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, uh, a question for Eduardo. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for uh, meeting with us. Um, my question is, 
what's your uh, method for working with your director of photography while you're shooting? Uh, my, mission, my method initially is that I spend about four weeks shot listing the whole movie. Shot listing the whole movie from the first scene to the last. So before I even speak to him, I have visually the movie in my mind. And then I share with him the shot list and then we begin a conversation. Because to begin a conversation with abstract themes and, and terms is a waste of time. Let's start with something concrete. This is what I'm imagining. What do you think? This is what I'm thinking. And, and then it really starts a very concrete conversation about shaping uh, that shot list, shaping the look. And of course, as I'm doing the shot list, I, 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 I share with him any kind of, you know, uh, stylistic uh, uh, ideas I'm having as far as tone is concerned, the aesthetic tone, the feel of the movie. Uh, so he can start also thinking about that as I'm doing my shot list. And, uh, and, and it's a very, you know, in the beginning, there are conversations about, um, you know, as, 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 as always, you know, there are conversations about the feel, you know, what do you want the movie to feel like, you know, and very importantly, something that uh, Robbie Mueller taught me. I, I was going to do a movie with Robbie Mueller and I went to Amsterdam to work with him. And for one week, all we talked about was what is the character of the camera? Who is the camera? What is this point of view? And that's something that really stuck with me. And now every time I shoot a movie, I always think, what's the, what's the character of the camera? Who is the camera? And so that was also a conversation that we had with, uh, with Angus. And here, the camera was obviously Momo. It was because I really wanted people to feel this whole movie through the point of view of Momo. The reason why, even narratively, that we don't quite know what is the true specific ailment. I know what ailment Madame Rosa has, but it's not really explained exactly in the movie because Momo will never know because he was not privy to these conversations. He's only privy to what adults tell him about it. So visually, it was the same thing. That's why many times in the movie, you see scenes of adults through the reflection of a mirror or through a doorway because we're always seeing it through his point of view. So that was a very important um, aspect of uh, the movie. And then it was really a matter of there, there is something that is baked into the movie, which is the drama of the movie. You know, I, I cannot remove, uh, and, and I would never want to, but the, uh, the drama of the movie is baked in. So then it's a question of how do you counter that? How do you create an aesthetic counterpoint so that the movie is dramatic and yet the aesthetic uh, aspect of the movie reflects these characters' desire to live to survive, to embrace life. Hence, the, 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 uh, the kind of uh, chromatic intensity of the movie, the, hand, the handheld quality of it, uh, the kind of, you know, uh, the kind of that, that, that kind of sense of reality that nothing is staged, everything is captured, stolen, nothing is static. Uh, because these people are not static. These people are always on the go, always on the move. So those were the kinds of conversations that we're having. Thank you. Very good. Pleasure. Um, okay, so I'm going to welcome over Tahir uh, Gawad, who's one of our current students. And I'll move you back over, Steve. Hey, Tahir, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Alex. Hi, Mr. Ponty. How are you? Hi there. How are you? Um, I'm good. Thank you. Um, my question is, um, for this film, how did you um, work with your editors and your composers? Um, what did you look for specifically? And, um, and just can you speak to the, the, those processes? Uh, I can, uh, well, I can, I can first speak uh, about uh, the editor. Uh, his name is Jacobo Quadri. Uh, Jacobo Quadri is truly a great artist. Uh, Jacob Otkladi is a very, very um, special uh, person. And he, what's amazing about it, what's amazing about him is that he has such a strong compass 
of where the movie should go. And he's willing to fight for it. And that's great. The problem with many editors is that they become yes men or yes women to the, to the, to the filmmaker. And that's a problem because then the first line of defense for a movie is the editor. There, you, you cannot have a person who will do anything you want and who will try. You need to have a person who will do everything, of course, who will try everything, but who, who has the courage to tell you very objectively, this works, Eduardo, this does not work. And Jacobo is that person. No matter who you are, he worked with Bertolucci, with, uh, with, with, you know, with, 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 the, with the greatest filmmakers in Italy. And the reason why they love working with him is that he is not scared to tell them this doesn't work. That's the most important thing. That's the most important thing. So for the editor, that's what you need. As far as Gabriel Yared, who is my composer for this movie, I'm a very musical director, very, very musical. And at the beginning, when he saw the movie, I brought him two versions of the movie. One with my temp music, which was not his, and one without music. And I asked him, what do you, what do you want to see? The movie with all my temp music or the movie without? And he said, no, I want to see the movie with your temp music because I want to see a little bit of your influences and everything. So already that was wonderful that he was, that he kind of wanted to immediately see that. And then it was a question of, you know, we, we got, we got unfortunately in a sense, and I said, unfortunately, because it was a bittersweet thing, the, the pandemic, even though I had to finish the movie remotely, not the editing, but all of post re remotely, the only, the only silver lining was that the pandemic added three months to my post-production schedule. That means that I was able to work with Gabriel for at least eight additional weeks that I couldn't have had the pandemic not been here. So, so we really used that time. And we used that time because we wanted to create um, a music uh, a soundscape that was, that was rather ambitious in, in the end because we start with Momo sensibility, you know, the trap beats at the beginning, the hip hop style, always though, not soundtrack, but score, right? You still have, you know, Gabriel's beautiful whistle theme. So you feel like it's a score, but really packaged like a hip hop a trap beat kind of a thing. And then slowly halfway through the movie, you start having or hearing orchestral uh, echoes. And that is Madame Rosa's sensibility entering Momo's heart, seeping into Momo's heart. So that if you, if you hear the first cue of the, the very first cue of the movie, because the movie starts in a way at the end, that's not really the first cue of the movie. But if you hear the first cue of the movie after that second voiceover, which is full trap beat hip hop cue to the very last one, which is full orchestra, the range of the music is enormous. And I really needed a composer that was as versatile as that, whilst at the same time keeping a certain uniformity because it can be 35 different movies. It has to be one movie. And Gabriel was, was great because he's very, very versatile. And we really also, you know, uh, uh, hired amazing people. And he's a French composer. He works in France. But for example, we recorded all the orchestra at Air Studios in London. And then all of the trap beat stuff was done here in LA you know, with like, you know, great producers, great hip hop producers. So, so it was wonderful to, to be able to have Gabriel, who was the core of the musical kind of, you know, and, and yet he was able and willing to branch out to LA producers for those cues. And then of course, having wonderful musicians at Air Studios to record the, the music was just, I mean, a joy, a joy, you know. And also to create all those, you know, Madame Rosa's theme is a very Hebraic theme. So to, to really find all these different sensibilities was something that Gabriel and I found together. And, uh, and also, you know what? I love melody. I, I like to watch the movie and in the end be able to sing something from the movie. I don't like wall to wall. I don't like eight total things that, I don't, that we don't just as sounds that I like, I like melody. And so Gabriel is great 
at Melody. Absolutely great. And then it was also a matter of, you know how many minutes we have of music in the movie? 31. 30, 31 minutes. It's a 93-minute movie. In a, in a normal movie of today, 93 minutes, you would have 80 minutes of, of music in the movie. 80. And it's because, you know, I, I worked with a composer in my first film who said something very beautiful. He says, I compose music to prepare for the silence that comes right after it. Silence is music. The dialogue is music. Traffic outside is music. The wind is music. Sound design is music. Music is not only music. There's a lot of music. And to work with a composer who understands that, that he's one layer of the music that will then have to get mixed in with the other layers of music. And when we were going into, you know, when we, when we decided to have music, it was a very specific thing. It was to give the, to very often to create a counter to what was happening, to balance what is happening. That was often, very often the case in our movie, you know? So it was a beautiful conversation and it's trial and error. If you, if you cannot find the right piece of music for a scene, it just means one thing. You don't need music and you're just being insecure because you think you need music because you're trying to hide something else. Don't use music as a crutch. Don't think that you need to add music. Change the scene. Change the editing. Don't add music. It's a waste of time. That scene will never be better with music. You just have to change the scene or get rid of it or get rid of half of it. Something needs to happen that is much more fundamental in the movie. And so that was, th those were our conversations with Gabriel. And it was lovely because he's, he's not only is he a very warm person, but he's a musical scholar. So he understood influences. He had respect for different kinds of music from hip hop to the Hebraic music in the movie to the more or orchestral pieces. He's great. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Okay, let's welcome over Catherine um, in the movie now. And so here I'm going to move you back to the attendee side. Hi, Catherine. Are you out there? Yeah, I am actually. I've got pages of notes. Edward, you're so eloquent. <laughs> I um, this has been most edifying, and I really enjoy your theories. And as a, a filmmaker who's worked mostly in the short medium, I really relate. Anyway, I teach a class. I did not invent this lofty title. It's called Film Analysis Through Literary Critique. And I have a lot of repeating students because my specialty is worldwide cinema, especially contemporary. And I announced today that your film was going to be the start of my spring semester in mid-January. Wow. People had already seen it because our class had to go online mm -hmm. and Netflix is our textbook. <laughs> God bless. You see? Lovely. So many people already were paying for text uh, for Netflix. I figured, well, I'm not going to sign them Amazon. I'll just stick with Netflix. Here we go. And then I'll recommend things from Amazon and HBO. So anyway, uh, when I was a teenager, I saw Madame Rosa. But my memories of it, other than this, Simone Schneider's face, um, was hazy. But I didn't want to read the plot details until I had watched your film um, two days ago. And, um, and I kept going, wait, there's a certain plot twist, and I don't believe in spoilers. I'll just say a relative of Momo's shows up in that other film. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, did they invent that for that film, or was it actually in the source material? Because I didn't see a credit for that other film. Only the book by Roman Gary. No, no, the 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 movie, my movie is not a remake of that movie. We just right. happen to share the source material. So so yeah, so it has nothing to do with that. So movie that was their invention. No, 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 no. That that scene is actually in the book. Oh, it is. Yeah, okay. That that scene is in the book. Yeah. So you opted to omit it. 
Yes, yes, because we were we were really focusing on the relationship between Madame Rosa and what happens is what happens is there's a choice that a filmmaker has to make when he's adapting when when he's adapting a book. Are you do you want to make sure that you're going to cram everything if you start cramming everything into a movie what your sacrifice is what you're sacrificing is the human oxygen of the moments you're sacrificing the moments in between people what is unsaid the glances the 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 silences uh because you don't have time because you have so much to cover and for us what was very important is was to focus on those silences focus on the connection the the deep connection between these two characters which is the heart and soul of the book did we have to sacrifice some things in order to uh to 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 elevate the core and the heart of the book absolutely we did but we did it for a reason and the reason was just as i said to 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 allow the audience to live and to experience the birth of this relationship you know what's what's something that i always told my actors you know momo and you know love is a there, there's something that happens when you fall in love when you've realized you've fallen in love with somebody that's not when your body started feeling love for that person that's when your body says nudges you in the in the in the shoulder and says you're in love but your body has been falling in love way before your mind knows that you fell in love and that's what happens with these two people these two people fight and bicker and are at odds with each other but all the while their body unconscious of both of them are falling in love with each other are falling in friendship with each other and suddenly they realize it and in order to create that connection that thing sometimes you have to sacrifice some scenes that are absolutely stunning in the book to favor that heart that soul you know we find that in the scene where the two boys share the bed mm. it's such a a wonderful moment that they're back to back <laughs> with each other yes and i have one other question because i didn't recall the lola character at all was she trans yes. in the book Ab absolutely absolutely yes she is okay so maybe that book inspired amon devar to do all about my mother where we have the trans lola and the right. film doesn't completely work until you actually meet lola i love this lola even more yeah thank you thank you no, and and you know what abril uh the actress who plays lola was was so wonderful. I mean, so absolutely wonderful. And 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 it's funny because when you cast the characters right, the characters occupy the same place on set that they occupy in the film. And she was really uh, a touchstone for us emotionally. She had with strength. You could count on her. Uh, she was always a breath of fresh air. She was always funny. She was always kind of full of light. And exactly like in the exactly like in the movie and and so and so it was absolutely lovely to to kind of have her be in the film just like she is she is in life that kind of uh uh that's just that's just light my wife is doing something that i'm not sure what she's trying to do oh what oh hold on she wants me to move this here so i'm not shaking okay here we go here we go Thank you so much. It's a gorgeous film. I can't wait to share it with all my students. Well, thank you. And, and if you want me to uh, to do a to do a class with you about it, I'll be more than happy to uh, to come and say hi to you guys. Okay. Thank or you. even on Zoom. On Zoom. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Lovely. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so. Uh, Maybe we should call maybe one more person, but the uh, before we do, I wanted to just uh, read this question uh, that came in. Uh, please talk about your use of rain in the movie. 
the two scenes that come to mind are when Rosa goes into a trance on the roof with the laundry and when Yusuf left. Um, felt like a powerful metaphor. Mm. Uh, rain has change. Rain is, uh, rain is, uh, rain is, uh, rain is transitions. You know, transitions are, are important, you know, when we're not one thing and we're still not, when we're leaving one thing and we're still not the other thing, whatever that is. That moment of flux is the moment where we're at our most vulnerable, but we're almost also at our most powerful. Okay, uh, let's take one more. Um, we'll bring over Caroline Simpson. Um, so let me move you over, Caroline. Hi. Hello. Hi. Uh, first of all, I wanted to say thank you uh, for coming to talk to us, but also my mom, I grew up between Morocco and France, so to her this novel, she feels really attached to it culturally, and so I'm sure she'd love to thank you for bringing it to light again and bringing it to the screen. Uh, on that note, I was wondering, you've mentioned already um, that this film covers themes that are timely and universal, be it of immigration acceptance, but also friendship and grief. Uh, what pushed you to, one, drag the story out of France, and then, uh, other than your personal ties to Italy, what made you decide to make it a, a film set, an Italian story, rather than a, a French story or even an American one? Mm. Because it's a European story, because it's a world story, because in the end, we are all living through the same movie over and over again in different countries. You know, France is going through the same story. Italy is going through the same story. Germany is, America is. So in the end, the country becomes less important than the people and the stories that they're living in that country, you know? So, so, so that's why I took, I, I, I dared do it because it is not a French problem. It is not an Italian problem. It's a world problem. It's a European problem. It's a global problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Caroline. I'm going to move you over. And uh, Eduardo, thank you so much for spending the night with us and sharing so many great insights into this beautiful film. Um, I look forward to a time when we can celebrate uh, on campus again. Um, yes. I'll let Dean Daly jump in to give us a proper send off. Oh, well just, Eduardo, a big thank you for being here and also for just giving us a great gift with this movie. Uh, we're deeply appreciative and I join Alex in saying, I wanna see it in Norris with you on the big screen. And it will be my pleasure. And thank you, Dean Daly, and thank you, the school, for, uh, for being there for us, uh, for us alumni through thick and thin and uh, helping us when we needed to. And uh, if there's anything that we can do to help, we'll, we'll always be here for you and for the school. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao.